Luli Faber interviews Jesus on the subject of how the human soul functions. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 1st of April, 2013. This is session one, part one. Well, welcome today to a discussion that I have invited Luli Faber along to join me with. And that discussion is about how the human soul operates. The main reason why I wanted to have this discussion with somebody was because we get many questions about the soul and how the human soul operates. But um, much of, many of these questions are based around assumptions that are false about the soul itself. And there is a, often a confusion between the mind and the soul. And there's also a confusion about what constitutes the soul as compa in, compared to the mind. And so during this discussion, we're going to talk primarily about how the soul itself operates in comparison to how the mind operates. And that's why we're, we're having the discussion. The, once we have this discussion, we have then the ability to refer to this discussion when we're answering questions about the human soul. And in the FAQ channel, there will eventually be many, many questions that we want to answer about the human soul. But most of the questions will be answered by referring to some of these principles that we're discussing in this, in this discussion that I'm having with Luli. So thank you, Luli, for coming along and joining me with the discussion. Pleasure. And, uh, and the may, uh, I just feel, like I've said to you off camera, that be, feel free to answer, ask any questions as we go along and also point, any points of clarification that you want to make. And uh, I've really just asked Lily to come along to keep me in line today. So, <laughs> so if you keep it's me in line today, concept. that would be great as well. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, just talk about the human soul in comparison to the spirit body's uh, organs and the physical body's organs initially, I feel. Um, when God created the human soul, he knew at some point that uh, due to its creation that he would separate the two halves of the soul and have an incarnation process where they could become individualized. And as a result of that, he, he created all of these sensory apparatus in each half of the soul that when the two halves of the soul split apart, the sensory apparatus in, in one half of the soul has to connect to something. And the sensory apparatus in the other half of the soul has to connect to something in order to experience the universe around it. And God created this wonderful process where a human couple who love each other, make love with each other, create a, uh, two bodies, the, two, the spirit body and the material body. And the, the, the soul, the half of the soul, the sensory apparatus, can now connect to those bodies through these cords and therefore experience the universe, firstly experiencing the physical universe and then experiencing the spiritual universe. And so, so the physical body has organs of its own. So we have the organs of sight, hearing, all the sensory apparatus, plus a brain and all the internal organs. And they all are used by the physical body in order to maintain itself while it's alive. And the spirit body also has a whole group of similar organs. Uh, it has a heart, it has a, it has a mind, it has the sense of sight and other senses, and in fact it has an even greater amount of senses than the physical body has. And so we have these two bodies, which are basically like organisms, or you could almost think of them as robots, that the half of the soul, the one half that split away from the soul in the union state in its unincarnated state, the half of the soul can now experience the universe through until it reaches the union state again in a conscious manner. Now, for all of that to occur, there, we must start to understand what we're developing if we're actually growing in love, what part of ourselves we're developing. So we're obviously not developing the physical body as, a, as the primary point of development, and we're also not developing the spirit body as the primary point of development. We're developing the soul. And so therefore, we need to understand how the soul works. We need to understand you know, how it's organised. And we also need to understand that our physical body and our physical body brain is actually being exercised by something be behind it through this silver cord that connects our, spirit, our physical body with our spirit body. And then our spirit body's brain and all of its other organ organs are also being influenced by something behind it. 
the, the, the soul of the individual, the, and it's the half of the soul of the individual because it's yet to be into a completed union state. Now, if we, if we remember that in this discussion, then that will help us greatly in terms of determining what the soul is and what the, the spirit body's mind is and what the physical body's brain is in particular. Because a lot of the questions we receive are all about, uh, a lot about, you know, if I exercise my mind in this direction, does that, how does that relate to my soul? And has my soul developed if, my, if I've developed my mind? And there's all this uh, there's all this idea or concept that people have that you can make your mind be more loving when that's actually a physical impossibility. And there's all these basic concepts of misunderstanding that I feel cause people's questions that we, we really would like to iron out. And the way we can iron them out is by discussing how the soul works, how the spirit body works, how the physical body works to a degree, and how they all fit together to, to become our conscious existence firstly in the physical world and then in the spirit world. So if we refer firstly to this physical body, of which you've have a, had a lot of uh, work on the brain and so forth, you, yep. you can see in science that generally there's a lot of emphasis on the brain and its ability to control all of the functions of the physical body. And what have you found in that process? What, if you found... Well, there's, <clears throat> there's just a complete mystery as to how it manifests the mind. Yes. You know, everyone thinks that somehow a bunch of nerve cells going off can create thoughts and ideas and beliefs. And personality. And, per and personality and free will and all these things. But yeah. no one has the foggiest, like there's not even a theory. No. It's just, you know, no idea. No idea about yeah. how it works. And, and so what we need to do is look, talk about perhaps a bit about how it actually does work so that people can understand. So firstly, we've got our physical body and let's focus on our mind because that's where a lot of our thought obviously seems to take place, if we could say. But the reality is, as you know, through working with the brain, that a part of the brain can die and then you would think if that part of the brain had died, then the thoughts associated with that part of the brain would also be dead. But there's been occasions when a person's gone through some kind of recovery process uh, after a stroke, for example, and then all of a sudden, they get back the memories that you thought they lost. Uh, and that's pretty obvious then that that part of the brain didn't contain the memories that they lost. It was a temporary loss for some reason. They explain it as it's some kind of diffuse network of information and they just source it from another bit of the network. Exactly, know? exactly. And then there's also the issues that you would have heard about too, and, and it's pretty obvious that people have lost their sense of sight. And then all of a sudden, through some uh, medical operation or whatever, regain their sense of sight. So, so this kind of, uh, these kind of instances show that, that the, if the physical body loses a sense of some kind, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person behind the physical body has lost that sense at all. What it means is that the physical body is unable to manifest it, is unable to actually have an outward manifestation of what the capability is anymore because of the loss of the sense of the physical body. So the physical body has senses of its own that obviously are connected to something behind it, and that's our spirit body. So our spirit body has a sense of sight, our spirit body has a brain, and it exercises through this silver cord connection that we've talked about before, the, all of the senses of the physical form. All right? So, um, and so that means that if a certain sense that's in the physical form dies for whatever reason, you know, we haven't cared for it or we have an accident or, or for some other reason, uh, then, then we haven't lost the memories of the, or, or, or lost the capacity to see in the case of a sight, if it's the sight, the capacity to hear if it's the case of a hearing sensation and, and other capacities. We haven't lost those capacities. We've just lost the ability to control them in the physical body. That's the only thing we've lost. And those, all of those capacities still exist in the spirit form. Now, if we look at the spirit body, it's almost identical to that. It's almost identical in operation to the physical body in reference to the spirit body. The spirit body in reference to the soul is almost identical in operation. So the pattern of the spirit body looking after the, and, and maintaining the physical body is the same pattern as the soul controlling the spirit body. So behind the spirit body is this 
organ, let's call it, let's call it a, the real us, the real person, the real individual, that has all these organs that control through a cord, a series of energetic connections with the spirit body and control its brain and control its operation of all of its, of all of its internal functionings and also control its ability to, to emanate those particular things, to, to actually do something with those particular things. And, uh, and make choices and decisions and live in the spirit world. And the, and the half of the soul needs the spirit body in order to connect with the spirit world. Uh, if it didn't have the spirit body, it would have a limited sensory uh, ability to connect with the spirit world. Just like if we d don't have a physical body, we have a limited sensory ability to connect with the f physical world. It's not that obvious to a spirit anymore that they're living in that world. Whereas when we've connected to a physical body on earth, it's very obvious that we're connected to a physical body and physical things. And th this is the reason why we need these bodies in order to grow. We and they're really like an educational system. The physical body being the educational system for our soul to learn the surroundings in our physical universe. The spirit body being the educational system that our soul uses to, to connect to the spirit universe. And then, of course, we, get, we can grow to even beyond that point where we no longer need anybody. And I don't mean we no longer need anybody. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, in terms you're of very people, independent. We don't need anybody, <laughs> physical or material, in order to express ourselves. And, in fact, we have the ability to create many bodies in that state. So if we examine all of that and we talk about the mind, which is the main thing that most people believe is the real person, the personality of the individual, and we talk about the soul, which is the real thing that is the personality and the individual person, and we start to compare where those things are and what happens to them, then you know, we'll have a far greater understanding of what we mean when we talk about soul development and particularly developing our soul to grow in love. So if we focus on the, on the mind and the brain and, and, the, and the spirit and the, and the soul as well in terms of how they all are influenced by each other, this brain only controls the physiological functions of the body in which it is, in which it is encased. It doesn't control the thought processes or the personality or the emotions of the individual. They can be expressed through the brain, of course, because that's the reason and purpose for the brain, to express what is behind it, what is at the back of it. But all of those things are felt in, usually, for most people, their spirit form, their spirit body. So, so they have a mind in their spirit body, which is really the, like the brain of the physical body, and most of their memories and most of their thoughts are stored in this mind of the spirit body, and therefore, as soon as they pass into the spirit world, nothing's really changed. They can remember everything, and usually they can remember even more than they could remember using their brain of the physical body because their brain was an encumbrance in many cases by the time you pass. It's a bit decayed and old <laughs> and not able to be used very well. Um, but, but your spirit body's mind and brain is able to be used a lot more with a lot more functionality. And therefore, you can have a, a larger speed of uh, gathering information a larger speed of absorption of information by, the, by that brain and so forth and, and gathering more facts about the universe. But behind that is the soul which has the real mind. And the mind of the soul is just an organ of the soul. It's just a small portion of the soul. It's where, in the end, all potential logical functioning can occur. But for most people who, who live, that's not the case. Because what happens is they have suppressed their soul so much that the mind of the soul is, is not functioning and they use the mind of their spirit body in order to determine truth or in order to, do, to, to determine anything, in fact about what they wish to do with their life, their personality, their nature, and all of other, all these other things are often a part of that, but not yet a part of their soul. And so what I, what I feel most people don't realise is that when they're using their mind, they're just using another brain, not the physical one, but their spirit body's brain, and they're using it in the, without any uh, reference to the soul, which is a very dangerous thing to do, actually, because it's also very logical to do. 
So that's the main relationship between the soul. The soul has eventually, when we're at one with God, the soul has its own mind. And in fact, the mind of the spirit body, the brain of the spirit body just becomes a tool that the mind of the soul exercises to express itself. Just like the physical body's brain is just a tool that the spirit body's mind uses to express itself. So there's this relationship between the three organs, if you like. Yeah. But it's possible in any, while you're in the physical form, to, um, to have the soul mind completely dominant. Yes. And the spirit mind completely um, just passive. Yes. Yes. And that, that was the transition I went through in the first century in the, before I became one with God. In the seventh dimension, you go through this transition. And in, in this transition, basically what happens is the mind of your spirit body, uh, it sort of becomes like absorbed by the mind of the soul. In other words, the mind of the soul dominates it now completely. And so what we need to understand is the actual mind, which is really the mind of the soul, is actually just a small portion of the soul itself. It's not the soul itself. It's just a portion of the soul. It's a, you could call it an organ of the soul. So, so just like we have an arm or a leg or a kidney or a liver or, or a brain, which is our organ of our whole body, the whole soul has many organs, but the organs of the soul are not of the same nature, of course, of our spirit form uh, or our physical form. But, uh, but they are, there are what you would classify as different processes that occur within inside of the soul that by themselves cannot independently operate without the complete soul just like we have in our body physically independent organs in our body that cannot operate without the body itself. They need the body in order to function. And it's the same with the mind of the soul. The mind of the soul needs so many other things in the soul to be functioning in order for the mind of the soul to be functioning. And therefore, it needs development of the soul in order to function. Whereas the brain of the spirit body uh, and the, uh, which is the mind if you, it, that most people use, and the brain of the material body, which is the physiological brain that we use to operate in this, in this physical world, those two things don't require much development in order to function. In fact, the physical body requires no development in terms of spiritual development in order to function. That's why God created it that way, so that we would be automatically functioning in a physical world. The spirit body, though, does require a certain amount of spirit development in order to function in the spirit world. So, so this is, and the reason why, is so that we develop in the spirit world and grow in the spirit world. So it does require a certain amount of spiritual knowledge and development uh, before a person will actually grow in their spirit form uh, in the spirit world. But the soul needs and can grow by itself individually and affect both bodies no matter where we are. It is independent of the physical world and independent of the spirit world. And so therefore has the greatest capacity for our interaction with all worlds. And, and I feel that's one of the things that most people are not aware of. They, they develop either their mind or they develop themselves physically. So a person, for example, developing their physically might, self physically might go to the to the local gym, you know, and, and, and do some, and then they might read some books and get a heap of knowledge as well. And partially that is also developing them spiritually. Whereas when they just go to the gym and pump iron, most of the time that's just, or go running or whatever, that's developing physically. As soon as they start picking up something that requires the engagement of their brain and therefore the engagement of their spirit body's mind, they're now starting to develop their spirit body as well, their spirit body's brain and also the body as a subsequent result gets developed through that process. And so, so they're now developing more than just their physical form. And then once you start developing this whole area of emotions and feelings and sensations and, and, and deeply emotional things, you're now developing the soul. And you can, the reality is you can develop all three things at the same time, obviously. But the soul has, its, has the greatest power. And the soul itself affects the functioning of both bodies. So if we have specific emotions in the soul, 
it will affect how the spirit body's mind actually even works and affect the physical body's brain and the physical body's, the whole body of the physical body, all of its organs, and affect how all of those work. And this is one of the reasons why we get sick, is because there's an interruption to how the soul can affect those particular things because of something that's gone on in the soul causing an interruption to the flow of energy and the flow of information from the soul to both bodies. So if most people understood that, then they'd start working on their soul when it came to sicknesses and diseases rather than working on just their physical body or their spirit body. Yeah. So I feel even that would answer a lot of questions for people as to, you know, diseases and sicknesses and, you know, if they've got some kind of terminal disease, for example. If they understand that behind their physical body is a spirit body and behind their spirit body is the soul and inside the soul when there's an interruption emotionally of some kind, it will cause an interruption in both spiritual and physical bodies which will create the disease. And, uh, and while that interruption remains in play, um, the disease will continue to grow. As soon as you reduce the in interruption from the soul, the disease will die a natural death and you become healthy again. And these kind of things need to be understood by a person who's trying to develop themselves, you know, to working out why they're sick and why they grow old and why, why they die even. It's all about what's going on in the soul. Yeah. So um, I suppose the main thing at this point is that we understand that the soul has organs of its own and one of which of those organs is the mind of the soul. The, the spirit body has organs of its own which maintain the spirit body and one of the organs is the brain of the spirit body. Um, the physical body has a brain right, that main helps maintain its body and it is just one of the organs of the physical body. And if people realise that the physical body is just like a robot that the soul uses to express itself in the physical world, and the spirit body is like the robot the soul uses to express itself in the physical world, then we would start to focus more on soul development rather than development of our mind. So the mind becomes sort of subservient to all other forms of development. Whereas for many people who are on earth, the mind is the dominant form of development that they engage in. They absorbed information through their mind and it's their main way of engaging with the world. And what I'm suggesting is that's not the main way the soul engages with the universe. Yeah. So um, just a question about the soul's mind. Is that, you know how when you list the attributes of the soul, like mm -hmm. the, um, the emotions and the personality and the free will, are they yeah. in the soul's mind? Uh, no, the, in... the soul's mind is a separate attribute of the soul okay. to those things. So, for so example, that's where the logic of the soul is. That's where the logic of the soul is expressed. The soul's mind is the organ in which the logic of the soul is expressed. Um, there are other organs in the soul that express all other different things that are much more powerful than the soul's mind, actually. So, for example, if we look at uh, the organs, the, there is, the soul has a heart. And the heart of the soul expresses the, the love-based uh, feelings and, and emotions of the soul. And they are far more powerful and far more powerfully expressed than anything the soul's mind is capable of expressing. So, so there are organs in the soul that are far more powerful than the, than the mind, which is one organ that exists within the soul. But it is a necessary organ in the soul because it, it's, it's a necessary, accessory organ for in the terms of it, it, d determining logic. It's like if, you like if you could liken it to a computer, it is like the microprocessor that is the centre of the computer that controls a lot of physiological functions of the soul in the same way. But it's not the dominant thing in the soul. And in fact, uh, if you've developed your soul, it becomes very subordinate. It is completely subordinate to other functionings of your soul. Uh, if I can give some other illustrations, so when we develop uh, humility, for example, we view that as a quality, right? Like a, uh, uh, but actually, it's developed in an organ in the soul itself. Humility uh, is a is a part of the organ of the so organs that are contained within the soul, and it's actually a larger part than the mind of the soul, 
and it also dominates the mind of the soul and how it functions, right? So in other words, the organ of humility, which, which, we, do, which we express as a quality, actually controls how the mind of the soul works, right? This is why humility is such an important quality to develop in your soul. Because how, how it controls the mind is that the mind is unable to accept anything that the soul is, lacks humility about. You know, or if we put it another way, the soul's mind cannot accept anything in, about which we are arrogant, in which we believe we know the truth but have not yet fully discovered it. And you can see why, of course, because if, if while I'm lacking humility, I am blocked to certain thoughts, to certain concepts. Uh, I believe myself to know them already, or I believe they are immaterial, or I believe they're not important, or I believe they don't exist. Uh, one of the, those things usually is what I believe when I lack humility. And so humility controls the thought processes. I will not accept the thought that humility, or my lack of it, determines I should not accept. And so you can see from that regard, the mind is sub completely subordinate to this quality of humility. Does and this sense? is both the physical, sorry, the spirit body's mind and the soul. Of course, because the spirit body's mind is just an expression of what's happening at the soul level anyway. So, so, so it will also greatly control what we'll allow ourselves to accept into our spirit body's mind. So, so we will not allow anything that disagrees with our concepts that exist within the soul with regard to the attitude of humility. So, so if I don't have humility on all subjects, it is only the subjects that I have humility on that I'll actually receive the truth about. And my mind is only capable of absorbing that truth while I am humble on that subject. As soon as I, as soon as I become, uh, have a lack of humility on that subject, that's like closing my mind to that particular subject now and my ability to, to learn more truth on that subject is now highly limited. Yeah. So, so in that regard, you can see that humility is a much greater quality to develop than intellectual development because it controls intellectual development completely. Um, if we have a look at another quality like love, Love is, uh, love is a quality that is understood by the organ of the heart of the soul. It is completely unable to be understood by the organ of the mind of the soul. So, so when we talk about expressing love, feeling love, uh, uh, acting in harmony with love and all these other different things with regard to love, our mind is completely unable to understand it, particularly, uh, and, and this is our soul's mind, is completely unable to understand it at all. It's Which is impossible. why we can't describe it in words. Exactly, it's impossible. it's impossible. It's impossible to describe effectively in words unless the person has had an emotional inflection of those words in their past. Right? In other words, they've had an experience of love in their past to which they can relate those words to. And, uh, and this is the limitation of our mind. Our mind is completely unable to understand feelings. Right? It can express them as thoughts, but it cannot understand them and feel them as feelings. And, uh, and this is one of our severe limitations of our mind, both spirit body and our physical body's brain, uh, but also the mind of the soul is limited in that regard. The mind of the soul is only able to express logical thought and is not able to, to actually feel feelings without the other organs of the soul being involved. So. So if a person hasn't developed their heart of their soul and they haven't developed the humility, the organ of humility in their soul, then you can see the, the, spirit, the, 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 sorry, the mind of the soul is going to have a lot of difficulty determining any truth and also a lot of difficulty feeling any happiness and joy in any other emotion. And this is why people do get to the stage in their development on earth and, and sometimes in the spirit world where that's all, they almost feel devoid of emotion. They almost feel devoid of that kind of understanding because they can't understand it because they've only developed their mind and the organs that understand these other qualities are all undeveloped. They're, they're all lacking development. So humility is lacking development. The heart of the soul is lacking development. 
And so therefore, love can't be understood, humility can't be understood. They can only understand intellectual logical reasoning, but the intellectual logical reasoning is flawed because it has not, it's not taking into account all these other developments that can happen. Yep. And it, the way God's made the universe is that without the entire soul being developed, the mind is incapable of understanding the universe. So, so that, that's a major limitation, obviously. If we're ever going to have to grow, we need to understand that part of our growth is going to be developing these other parts of our soul that are, that are independent of the mind itself. And in fact, that actually control the functioning of the mind itself. And so we need to understand that the development of the soul is the most important thing, not the development of the mind. And the mind has severe limitations in terms of its development. It's only capable of responding to stimuli without analysing very clearly the source of stimuli based on other, other emotional aspects of the soul or other organs within the soul. So, for example, the mind is often incapable of determining love by itself as a feeling because it's incapable of feeling love. The mind is incapable of accepting information about any subject unless humility is developed. So the mind itself can't, unless there is the soul that has, that's behind the mind having humility, the mind itself won't absorb any new truth on any, on any subject that the soul does not have humility about. And so you can see the mind is severely limited in its ability to reason, its ability to absorb truth, its ability to, to determine what the truths of the universe are and so forth. And, and while we focus on our mind, we, we continue to completely limit our abilities. Hmm. And it would be a really sad existence to just have your mind and no feelings whatsoever. It would just be like we wouldn't be human anymore, would we? That's right. And it's actually a physical impossibility to, ha to have just your mind and no feelings. So every single person who thinks they are focused on developing their mind and their intellect eventually does have joys and feelings as a result of their development. So, for example, when you, let's say you're in, a passion, in one of your passions and one of your passions is finding out about the brain. So the more you find out about the brain, you have some joy come up, right, which is a feeling of the soul. It's not actually something that happened in your mind. The joy came from a different place within you. Not, it didn't come from the development of your mind. And you're engaging your mind and eventually understanding something. That process of feeling that you understand. You know how you go through, I'm confused, I'm confused. Oh, now I get it, that feeling. <laughs> and, and once you have that transition of I'm confused into I get it, the, you can feel your soul leap with an emotion, right? And that's immaterial to the mind. It's not the mind having that, that sensation now. It's another organ that's been developed within the soul. So, so from a practical perspective, even the people who feel that they are 100% focused on the development of their mind are actually developing their soul because they have these different experiences of joy and other emotions that occur through the development of their mind that start developing their soul anyway. So, so it's a, from what I've observed, it's a, it's a physical impossibility to not develop your soul in some way. Yeah. The key is to engage it in a, a like a direct and uh, in a manner that doesn't, that, you know, we're, that we're not ignorant, that, that we have full disclosure of what's going on from the majority of people because we don't understand what's really going on. We don't know what we're developing. And in fact, the emotions almost seem to be something that you can't develop. You just have them. They're annoying <laughs> and, <laughs> they're and annoying someone side else's of, fault. <laughs> well, they could be annoying side effects if they're painful. And if they're yeah. pleasurable, they're great. They're you know, they're, they're, yeah, yeah. I'll accept those. But, but either way, we sort of still see them as side effects. We don't really see them as the actual things that we can develop that are a part of our soul. We see them as sort of the side effect of following a certain course of action or exercising our will in a certain direction. But the reality is that these parts of, uh, are parts of our soul and our soul can be developed so much so that the soul's functioning controls the mind completely. That everything our mind chooses to do and, and, and every thought that we ever have is driven totally by the other parts or the other organs that exist within the soul. Yeah. So, so I feel as an introduction, the key thing for people to, re to remember is that God designed the soul 
to have a mind, but the mind is not the soul. The mind is an organ of the soul. The mind is a part of the soul, and the soul has many other parts, and many other parts of the soul are much more important than the mind because they control the mind. They control how the mind thinks. They control everything that it processes. And so these other organs, uh, and the organs of love and the organs of humility and other organs that exist within the soul, all part and parcel of certain parts of the soul itself, they need to be developed if we're truly going to grow as, a hum as humanity, not, our, not just our mind. Our mind will subsequently come along for the ride because it is under complete subordinate, it is completely subordinate to the soul itself. And, uh, and, what, and that's whether we think it's subordinate or not, it is still subordinate. So even if we believe that our mind is superior and our soul is not being uh, developed in any way, our, our, our mind is still subordinate to many of the functionings of the soul. It's just that we're not conscious of it in our mind because we don't wish to be. Like I said, anything that we're not humble about, we won't be able to process, even though it might be happening. We still won't be able to process it. Yeah. So I sort of feel like if, if most people understood those basic concepts, then we can introduce some basic concepts about how the soul works in comparison to the mind. If they, if they don't understand that the soul is the dominant part of yourselves, and remember here we're talking about the half of the soul, which, which, is, which is really, in the end, we want to be connected with our other half of the soul, but initially we need to develop our half of the soul, the part that we're connected with too, with this body, before we can ever expect to connect with the other half of, of the soul. And the half of the soul uses the sensory apparatus of the physical and spirit bodies in order to experience both of those worlds. And if we, un if we understand that un basic understanding, then we will start to get some of the principles that we're going to mention when we discuss the different sort of understandings, if you like, of how the soul actually does operate and how I can change my soul and how I can have my soul grow and what resistance is in my soul and how can I determine what's loving and what isn't and how can I determine what is truth and what isn't. And once we understand how the soul works, then it, it will all make sense. All of those things will make sense to us. If we don't understand how the soul works, we will often try to develop ourselves in a certain direction only to find that it's a dead end. And then we have to retrace our steps generally and find the path that's not a dead end anymore. And the path that's not a dead end is always God's path because it's always the road to infinite understanding. Mm. So did you have any more questions about it in this introductory phase, or do you think we I just go into... I did have one. Yeah, fine. Um, it was about God's intention when God created it this way. Yeah. Um, so the way God intended it was that both the mind of the soul and the mind of the spirit body would just be, um, like, just tools. Yeah, you could say that... From the word go type thing. Yeah, I, I, I think if I can explain it this way, better it would be better. Remember, if we, can, if we look at the soul, we're talking about half of the soul here. What I'm saying is that the, the whole soul has a mind, right? And I'm only developing half of it when I develop the mind of my soul. I'm only developing half of it. But the spirit body has a complete brain that is not shared by somebody else. It's our brain. It, thoughts can be dropped into it from external stimuli, but, but it's our brain completely. So the half of a soul connects to a whole brain in the spirit body and a whole brain in the physical body. But the half of the soul only has half of its brain functioning. Without the other half, a full soul brain cannot be realised. Does that make sense? A full yeah. soul's mind cannot be realised. And we need to understand the difference between these functions. So. So it's the half of the soul that exercises control over the spirit body's brain or the mind of the spirit body. It's a half of the soul that does that, not the complete soul. The complete soul does not need the spirit body's brain at all to function. It only, the half of the soul needs the spirit body's brain because it hasn't yet joined to the other half of the soul and therefore is, is not capable of experiencing 
all the stimuli that the complete soul can experience in terms of learning. And until such a time that it voluntarily undertakes the process of joining with the other half of itself, it will never have that functioning. So while we remain half a soul, while we remain independent of our soul mate or uh, through and not go, don't go through a soul union, we need the, the mind, the half of the soul's mind, which is only half of the soul's mind or brain, needs the spirit body's mind in order to express itself. Okay. But okay. as you grow and grow into a soul union state, once you get into a soul union state, in the soul union state, the mind of the spirit of the soul doesn't need any spirit body minds in order to express itself because it now has a complete functioning organ of its own mind in order to express itself in a, in a logical manner. Does that make sense? Whereas when, when we are just a half of a soul, we must have a connection to a spirit body form and we need to use the spirit body's mind in order to express ourselves. But we're still, we've still got half of the soul's brain that we're using in order to express ourselves through that spirit body's mind. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. yep. So it's, it's relatively logical when you think about it all. We've got half of our soul, which is what we see as our real self, but we're really only half of our real selves. And uh, so I'm sitting here, but the other half of me is somewhere else at the moment and the other half of you is somewhere else. And, but we have also our half of the brain that we can develop in our soul. But that only usually starts developing once we trans, make the transition between the sixth and the seventh dimension of the spirit. So it's not a graded development? Up in it is a graded development, but we, we usually first notice that something is different by the time we hit the seventh dimension. Um, up until that point, usually the mind remains dominant still. Our own spirit body's mind remains dominant. But the development of the, of the soul's mind begins usually right down in, in the third and second dimensions of the spirit world when we start developing our spiritual natures and our emotional natures. And this is what causes or triggers the development of the soul and the development of the soul's mind. And so that begins way, way earlier, but, but we usually get to a point where we notice it, right? And, and if we have followed the divine way, the God's way in our development, we will notice it earlier than if we follow the natural love development. If we follow the natural love development, which is our own way, we, we can even get to the sixth dimension of the spirit world and not even know that our soul's mind has been developed in any way or that we even have a soul. So can you just give an example of what difference you might notice as you're using your soul's mind? The more? soul's mind, remember, is connected to these other organs and the, these other organs include love, humility, the expression of emotion, the expression of affection, the expression, all, of these, all of these emotional aspects, which we could define as emotional aspects, are of the soul. So you will find that a person who's developing their soul becomes more emotional they also become more, you can feel more from them. You feel more of their personality. You feel more of their nature. It's not like they're sort of a, a rigid intellectual being anymore. They're now a very, they're a soft, changing personality that you can sense and feel quite strongly at times. And, and in fact, uh, you can feel the love that's in them and you can feel the other emotions that are in them quite readily as well. They haven't shut those particular things down. That's an indication that their soul has started to be developed. And the soul's mind is now starting to be affected by that development. Whereas a person who um, tries hard, sort of almost like the Buddhist way, trying hard to suppress desire and suppress emotion and suppress feeling, what they're trying hard to do is to use their mind to control their soul. Now, of course, that's a physical impossibility in the end. You can't actually do it. No one, no one historically has ever successfully done it. And the reason why, that's the case, why that is the case is because God created it that the mind would be subordinate to the soul, not the other way around. And God created it that this mind is an organ of the soul and not the other way around. The soul is not an organ of the mind. And for that reason, um, we, we, it was impossible, in fact, to suppress 
our soul, using our mind, using our intellect. And so that's why you see the soul of the person come out at times. You know, even if a person is very intellectual in their development, you'll see their joy come out. You'll see other desires come out as they express themselves. And that's the soul being developed. That's the part of, the, part of them that is the real part of them. So, so um, this soul can be consciously developed, um, but for the majority of humanity at this point in time, the soul is unconsciously developing. You know, as a person develops their mind, learns new things, they experience certain joy and that causes their soul to feel some things and therefore become developed. So that's the way that most people develop at this point in time. But, but we could, instead of doing that, engage the soul's development, which is what I chose to do in the first century and what every person who's become a celestial spirit has chosen to do, and, and we can do this on earth. We can engage the development of the soul rather than the development of the mind. And as a result of engaging the development of the soul, the mind will subsequently develop more rapidly because the mind is controlled by organs of the soul that, that we, most people don't realise it's being controlled by at this point. So, for example, the soul's ability to feel controls how the mind thinks. The soul's ability to love controls how the mind thinks, controls its choices, controls its logical reasoning. The mind's ability, the soul's sorry, ability to be humble controls what the mind in terms of knowledge can absorb. So we can see that if we develop our soul, then our mind will have greater capacity to develop and greater capacity for understanding. If we don't develop our soul, our mind has no capacity for understanding at all if we're not careful. And this is why people who can have who don't develop any part of the soul, which is very hard to, to to do, of course, consciously, you can't really do it consciously. But people who spend very little time developing the soul also become very illogical in their understanding of the universe. They have all sorts of theories that they believe as facts that that are impossible to substantiate and are very illogical in their reasoning because their soul, the organs of the soul, all of the organs of the soul aren't being used to determine the truth. Uh, only the mind is, and the mind's trying to operate independently of all these other organs, which are all going to control how the mind absorbs truth. Yeah. So it's very important for people to understand that they will not be able to receive love through their mind. They will not be able to receive truth through their mind. The mind can be involved in the process, but it's not going to be the thing that controls the absorption of love or truth. And if we're developing towards God, love and truth are the two things we're wanting or seeking. And so we're going to struggle if we use our mind to, to seek those two things. Yeah. Is there any other questions you had about it? No, no, no that's it. So, so probably what we could say in summary into the introduction to this material is that we must understand that the soul has an organ called the mind, but it is just a subordinate part of the soul. The soul has many other organs and many other things that we can develop that are more important than our mind. And if we do not develop them, our mind will also be unable to develop fully. The spirit body's brain, which, we often re which spirits often refer to as the mind and people on earth often refer to as the mind, is just a part of that of that functioning of the soul's mind. And the more dominant we become with our, in terms of our material state, the more it'll turn out that we, we suppress the soul's ability to understand truth, suppress the soul's ability to, to understand the universe around us. And so God designed us purposefully with a soul so that we could come to understand everything in the universe. But what man is doing is they are suppressing the soul most of the time. And for that reason, they are struggling to understand the universe. And they've, they're struggling with their mind to understand even our own bodies, let alone the universe. Uh, but as soon as we start to allow the soul to be part of the absorption of knowledge, then what's going to happen is it will stop struggling to understand the universe and all new, these new truths, of which there will be many myriads of truths arrive to humanity through this process, 
all these new truths will be start to be absorbed by the soul. And so the soul has a greater capacity to understand the universe as a result. So I think that's a great thing about the way God's created it. God's created it in such a way that we have the complete capacity to understand everything that God's created eventually if we develop our soul and not just our mind. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So the first principle that I'd probably like to introduce is the principle of preclusion. So as it relates to the soul. Right. Yeah. Would you like and, to tell and if we just explain to people that these principles are just names of given things, they're not, you know, they're not something they're just labels that I've given to a certain type of understanding. And if we can describe the understanding, then they'll be able to associate the label with the understanding. Mm. Okay. Mm. So would you like to describe what preclusion is? Yeah, preclusion is the, is the principle and it's, uh, it's based upon this basic premise about how the soul operates and how God created the soul. God created the soul so that, so that truth and error cannot exist in it at the same time. So preclusion is this basic understanding that while truth exists on a certain subject inside the soul, then an error on that same subject inside the soul cannot exist. And and the same applies with errors. While an error exists within the soul on, on a certain subject, at the same time, truth cannot exist on that same subject. It precludes truth from existing. So, so error and truth that exist in the soul are independent of, of each other in a way that there's the, truth and error cannot exist on the same subject at, at the same time in the same soul. And, uh, and so this, this can help us a lot if we understand this, if we understand that that, that is the case. So what, what I feel preclusion helps us do is to understand that while I might have certain beliefs in my mind, it doesn't necessarily mean they've entered my soul because the entering into the soul of that particular belief will de depend upon whether error or truth already exists in the soul about that particular thing. And so the error inside of my soul precludes the truth from existing if, it, if the error already exists in the soul. So this is about the state or the condition of the soul right now. It's not about some future state or how change happens or any of those things. It's really a statement about what is the state of my soul right in this moment the state of my soul right at this moment on, on a particular issue or subject. This is my state. While error exists inside of my soul on that subject, it's impossible, no matter how much I think it's possible, it's impossible for truth inside of my soul to exist on the same subject. So that could be any kind of feeling or belief? Yes, yeah, so it relates to beliefs, it relates to feelings, it relates to all sorts of issues. Remember that our soul is the feeling part of us. Remember the, the dominant organs of the soul are not the mind of the soul, but are the emotional parts of the soul, the heart, the humility and other parts of the soul. They are the dominant parts of our soul. That, that's what controls what happens with our mind. So, so, so something might enter our mind externally. So you might tell me a truth about the universe but while I have an emotion or feeling or belief inside of my soul that is different to that truth that you've told me it's impossible for me to absorb it into my soul that truth I have to first get rid of the error and we'll talk about that process as a separate process because that's the process or the or the change that has to occur to the soul in order to absorb truth this this idea or understanding of preclusion is about the state as it is right now. And, and I feel a lot of people don't understand the current state of their soul because they don't understand this basic principle. They think that what exists in their mind is the truth about what's in their soul. But this, and this is also why psychologists have come up with the concept of unconscious behaviour. What they, you know, what they call a lack of conscious behaviour or the subconscious is eventually what they've called it. The reason why we have the so-called subconscious is because our soul has a completely different idea or concept on a particular subject to what our mind does. 
And it's always our soul that dominates our mind. It's always our soul that dominates our actions and, our, and everything that we choose to do and even dominates our thoughts in the end. And so, so this so-called concept of subconscious has been created because of not understanding this idea of preclusion. Yeah. So for someone who wants to know what their soul condition is, yeah. like that's quite pertinent to this point, isn't it? Of course. So it's, it's to look at with honesty that what they're feeling and also to look at their actions. Exactly. Look at the actions and the feelings. And, and a lot of people are not very sensitive to their feelings, of course. And so probably the best course of action is to look at the actions, what, what your soul is attracting, because that will tell you the truth. And when I say what your soul is attracting, there is a law called the law of attraction that controls how things come to you from the universe. And, and what it, how, it, how it works is that the soul in a certain condition will attract certain things in order to expose its condition, whether the mind of the person believes they have that condition or not. So, so this is what I see with a lot of spiritual development on the planet. For example, if we take the average Christian, the average Christian probably thinks they believe in the Ten Commandments and believe in the commandments that I gave in the first century of you must love your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind, the whole strength, and love your neighbour as yourself, right? So they might feel that. They might think that that's what they believe. But, but the reality is, as soon as a war comes along, a lot of times they're the first person to enter it. Now, particularly if their own family or their own country is being threatened. Now, if the law of loving your neighbour as yourself had truly entered their soul, they could never contemplate going to war, ever. So that tells me that the feeling of loving your neighbour as yourself has yet to be created inside of the soul. Instead, there is another feeling that's there already, which is the feeling is, I'm able to kill my brother or sister or my neighbour under certain conditions. If they threaten me, for example, um, I should kill them. If, I th if they threaten my life or they threaten the life of my family or they might you know, try to rape my partner or under certain conditions, I can kill them. That's, that's their thought. So, so, you know, that is proof, if you like. And I'm just checking my mic because I think I turned it off. I think I've been recording all that. So anyway, sorry about that, Eagle. So that, that is proof that the actual feeling of loving your neighbour has yet to enter the soul. All that's happened is they've had the thought that they should love their neighbour and they think that in, pro, in doing what the Bible says that they've actually, they've actually honoured or obeyed that particular command. But the reality is the command itself and the desire to do so has not entered their soul because they're willing to go to war. So there's an example of how the mind might think one thing and the soul be in a completely different state. Yeah. And this idea of preclusion, we will start to understand why it's in a different state. Because the feeling of loving my neighbour has not entered my soul. I just have it in my mind as a thought. And this is the problem with the mind is the mind can have both error and truth on the same subject in it at the same time, whereas the soul cannot. The soul, it's impossible to have error and truth in the soul at the same time on the same subject. And that's what the thought of preclusion is all about, the idea of preclusion is all about. We must understand that it's impossible for our soul to have the same thing in it on, different, on, on the same subject at the same time, but with different opinions. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing if you think about it, because it, I can then go, okay, what is my real feelings? What are the real thoughts of my soul? The real thoughts of my soul is I'm willing to go, in this case we gave, I'm willing to go to war under certain circumstances. So I, the feeling of loving my neighbour as myself is definitely not in my soul. It's just a thought. It's just an intellectual or concept or idea that I'm not actually following for some reason. And once I know that, I can then start to investigate what the reason might be. 
But if I don't know that, I'll probably never investigate the reason. I'll probably just logically justify why I should be able to go to war and kill my brother under certain circumstances. And this is where the mind becomes totally unreasonable because the mind will justify the soul's error. And, and, and the reason why it does is because we often want to retain the error in the soul and we don't want to change our soul to, to accept the new thing for, for emotional reasons. There's emotional reasons why we don't. Mm. Okay. Well, you came up with another example here. Sure. Um, which was the, the truth was that the soul, the real me, is the pinnacle or creation of God. Right. So when a person first hears that truth, they sort of usually go, yeah, I get that. You know, we're a pretty amazing creation. Like if you look at humanity, you know, we've got our free will. We, none, none of the other creatures in the universe seem to have that that we've met anyway. And then, um, you know, so we have this concept that, wow, we are the pinnacle of creation. Well, it's pretty, we're a pretty amazing creation. But then, but. <laughs> but then they want to go out and get drunk. Exactly. And they justify getting drunk. So how does this work? I'm going to say, we're, on one hand, we're saying we're the pinnacle of creation of God. But on the other hand, we're acting like we're not in the sense of we're harming ourselves. So if I give you more, more of a background of that, we know that when we drink alcohol, we usually, if we do it to excess, we wake up in the morning with a very, <laughs> very sore body, right, and sore head. We also know that it kills brain cells. Even a small portion of alcohol kills brain cells that if we ingest alcohol. So bearing that in mind, if we really believed we were the pinnacle of the creation of God, do you think we would drink alcohol? Probably not, right? But the fact that I desire to drink it or, you know, if a person does desire to drink it, I don't anymore. But, but the fact that somebody desires to drink it is proof that the other truth, that I am the pinnacle of the creation of God, has yet to enter my soul. It's only entered my mind. And it cannot enter my soul because something else already exists in my soul. Which, and that something else is willing to determine my actions of even killing my brain of my physical body under certain circumstances. I'm willing to take an action that results in the destruction of my brain, which is an indication that I have not yet really accepted that I am the pinnacle of the creation of God. <clears throat> yeah, there's emotions in there that they are wanting to escape from that are quite the opposite of being the pinnacle of the creation of God. Exactly, exactly. There's something inside of the soul which causes them to feel that they're not the pinnacle of the creation of God even though in their mind they think they've accepted that particular concept. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Um, there's no, do you want to go for another example? Sure. The other go. example was um, the truth is it's not loving to be violent. Mm -hmm. We sort of touched on this with the Christian thing. Yeah. And the error is I want to punch that guy in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, the average person on the planet would go like would shy away from violence under most circumstances. However, there are times when the average person on the planet feels violence is justified. Yeah, like sometimes when you're watching a movie, and um, and you think you you know I'm really loving and I wouldn't want them to be violent, and then you're like yeah go on. yeah go on go yeah. on <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right. And that emotion of yeah go to get go and get them be violent now that's a, that's that's triggered something inside of the soul that's already existed in the soul. But, but, but when you think about it, the thought of I want to be loving all the time is really just a thought under those circumstances because if you have enough stimuli in a certain direction, whatever is in the soul will become the truth. And if, if the soul says, no, I'm willing to justify violence under certain circumstances, then you'll justify violence under those circumstances every single time. And even if that means somebody dies as a result of your actions, you'd still justify violence under those circumstances. And that, that is an indication that of this preclusion concept. And that's this idea that while in my soul I have a justification of violence under certain circumstances, I am, it is impossible for me, no matter how much I exercise my mind, it's impossible for me to be loving under all of, all of those circumstances. Because I will use even my mind as a justification for the underlying flawed emotion in order to express that flawed emotion. So the, if once we understand this, I feel, and, and if we're talking now, if we talk a bit about love and how it affects this, if, I, if I'm going to become more loving, 
then I have to at some point understand that there's things inside of my soul that preclude me from becoming more loving while they exist in my soul. So I can hear the truth, and this is what we, I find ha happening a lot to people who come along to our semin seminars. They hear the truth, they like what they hear, but it's only a thought based on what they like. It's not actually entered their soul yet because you put them in the situation. Sometimes the very situations I describe when I'm talking to them in the seminar and they act immediately out of harmony with love, which is an indication that the love hasn't touched their soul enough for the truth to enter their soul yet about that particular thing. And the only reason why that's occurred is because of this concept of preclusion. While an error exists in the soul on the same subject, the truth cannot enter them. So that they will not be able to change while that error stays in the soul on that subject. It's impossible for them to change. Now they can think they've changed, but that matters not. It doesn't matter at all. It's just, and this is why a lot of people go, this is why a lot of people go to the reversion to the subconscious concept. Because they go, I thought I changed, but just something happened and something flicked in me and I just went and did it anyway. You know, that's my subconscious, is it? You know, that's what my subconscious has determined. Well, no, it's what your soul's error has determined. And if you understood the soul's error, you could have released that error and it wouldn't have determined. And then, of course, once the error no longer exists in the soul, it no longer determines the course of action or conduct and it no longer determines the reasoning of your mind. It no longer determines it in the same direction. So if you talk to the average person on this planet about violence, if we get back to that example, the average person on the planet has a mind that says and justifies logically to them, they think they have logical arguments and reasons for justifying violence. Like most people on the planet feel they have a logical reason for justifying violence. If you look at the results of violence in the course of history, we can see that there's really no justification for it ever. And in fact, if you look at the results from a logical perspective, you think, wow, every single time somebody's reverted to violence, there's extra pain and suffering and probably oftentimes more violence. Every single time. It's only when somebody's forgiven that that hasn't occurred. But the logical mind of a person who has this feeling in their heart can't absorb that. They don't understand the principles of forgiveness and they will not be able to understand the principles of forgiveness until their desire in their soul of wanting under certain circumstances to be violent has left, has left them. Until it leaves them, they will continue in their own mind to justify violence, even seeing and observing the negative outcomes of such violence. It won't have an effect logically on them. So. And, and they're, in they're in denial about their own contribution, about their own feelings to what's actually happening. Totally, of course, because their, their feelings are contributing to violence, in fact. And this is why there's this statement that some people have made that violence begets violence. And, and it does. That's the reality. If I'm violent towards you, unless you are of very high development in love, you will probably want to be violent back to me. Right? And, and, and of course, people today feel no matter how high developed they are in love, they should be violent back because, that, because the original violence justifies the subsequent violence is the way they believe. But we've, we've had a record in humanity over... over Tens of thousands of years, we've had this record in humanity that every time violence has been engaged and somebody's returned with violence, that the situation has worsened, not improved. So, so we have proof and evidence that this is not true, but, but very few people on earth even accept it logically because they ha have in their soul the justification. The justification, while it remains in their soul, will determine even their logic. It will determine how they think while the justification exists. And that's the concept of preclusion. The concept of preclusion, basically, to remind everyone, is this concept that while an error exists in the soul on a certain subject at a certain time, it is impossible for the truth to exist in the soul on the same subject at the same time. The error precludes the truth from existing. By the way, the flip side is also true with preclusion, and that is while a truth exists in the soul on a certain subject at this time, it is impossible for an error to actually be felt by the same soul at the same time on the same subject. That's also a truth. So you can see that uh, this, 
is a great thing if you think about it. If we allow the errors to be released and we absorb the truth, right, which brings us to, our, to the next point really, which we'll stop in a minute and talk about. If we allow the error to be released and we are then able to absorb the truth, then we can change and our soul can change and our reasoning will change and our logic will change, everything will change as a subsequent result of understanding that basic principle. Yeah. So can you, um, can you, like you can release the error and absorb the truth. Is it possible to release the truth and absorb an error? Of course. Oh. Of course. And we'll talk about absorption in a minute oh, and okay, the possibilities that are involved. But yes, of course, this happens very frequently. For children? No, for adults on this planet. It also happens frequently. And under certain stimuli, and we'll talk about those particular stimuli, but yes, it's certainly possible for the soul to release a truth and absorb an error. Um, but but, but uh, obviously it depends on how, how much the soul desires that truth or desires the error as to how well that occurs. Yeah. So that, that's our first topic, our topic of preclusion. And remember that preclusion is just a label for this idea or concept that while a certain error exists in the soul, on a certain subject at this time, the truth will not be able to exist in the soul on the same subject. And that's what the principle of preclusion is all about. Thanks, Lily. Okay, thanks. So now we come to the second uh, concept or understanding that we'd like, that we need to understand if we're going to truly understand the development of our own soul. And that's the concept of absorption or understanding absorption. All right, so would you like to tell me what absorption is? <laughs> what is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the, it's the principle that we cannot change unless the thing preventing change is released from ourselves. And, and so if, if we state it more clear, carefully, um, I cannot absorb any new truth, or let's state it another way, I cannot have truth flow into my soul while error exists in the soul on that same subject. And I cannot have new error be absorbed into the soul or flow into the soul if truth exists in the soul on the same subject. So this process of absorption is all about the change that occurs in the soul. It's all about so remember the first point, preclusion, was about the state of the soul. The second point is about how we can make the soul change from its state to a new state. And what we're basically saying is the state of the soul cannot change unless somehow the error that's in the soul that causes the state to remain the same and the truth in the soul that causes the state to remain the same is somehow released, is, is given up. There's got to be a process by which we can give up both truth and error if we wanted to. And there is, and we can discuss that in another point. So this process of absorption or the, or the concept of absorption is we cannot have a truth or an error absorbed into our soul while the opposite thing exists already in the soul at the same time on the same subject. And uh, if we understood this, tr you know, really understood this at the soul level, we would, we would give up trying to learn new things with our mind without going through some kind of process that allows those particular things to be absorbed into our heart, into our soul. So we, we'd give up that entire process if we understood this. What about um, if, if you're, you're learning a new truth but there's no error in your soul opposing that? Then the truth will enter it just immediately. Goes straight in. Oh. It'll just go straight in. Yeah, okay. it, it will flow in because there is an emotional openness to the absorption of that truth. The same applies to the error, of course. If, if there is no truth in the soul on a certain subject and there's no error in the soul on the same subject, right, then, then the soul is also emotionally open to absorbing error as well as truth. And this is what it is like for a child. A child, when they first incarnate and they first... Uh, 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 conceived, from that moment on, they're absorbing everything in their environment without check, without any resistance, because in their soul, they started with a blank soul with no truth or error in it. 
and because there was no truth or error in it, in that blank soul, they, they can absorb anything. They can absorb truth and error. So if the parents were in a high amount of truth, then the child would start absorbing a lot of that truth. If the parents are in a high amount of error, then the child starts absorbing error. And what normally happens, of course, on the planet is that the parents are in a, you know, what we'd classify as an average amount of truth and an average amount of error. And as a result of that, then the child themselves also absorbs the same errors and truths that the parents had. And, some of, and, and so therefore starts acting upon them as they develop in their brain, in, in their mind. So would you say that this absorption is the experience of the truth as it enters you? Um, I don't feel the truth is an entity, because an entity implies like a being or a person. But, but the truth itself um, is available on any particular subject. And yes, it is. The process of absorption is the experiencing of the truth not as an intellectual concept or thought, but rather as an emotional experience. So this is why I often say in presentations to people that the truth is emotional. You can't accept a new truth without going through an emotion. And in fact, usually you can't accept a new truth without going through two emotions. The first emotion is the release of the error. And this is the concept that we'll discuss further in another section. And then the second emotion is the absorption of the truth. So, so the reality is, yes, the truth is an experience that you have to go through. It's not ever going to be an intellectual concept if it's going to change your soul. So there are plenty of people who have heard the truth in their mind, but it hasn't changed their soul. And you put the same stimuli from, a, from an event onto their soul, some kind of trigger that hits their soul, they'll react completely different to what their mind would have suggested to them because the truth hasn't entered their soul yet. And the only way the truth is going to enter the soul is for the error in the soul to go through some kind of process of release. And we'll talk about the process of release as another point. But, but we need to understand this concept that we can't absorb new truth while error is existing. And we can't absorb even new error while truth is existing. So that's great too. So when we get to the point where we have absorbed a new truth into our soul that is in harmony with God's truth. And remember, every time I'm referring to truth here, I'm referring to the absolute truth of God. We can't absorb that truth into our soul um, while an error exists. But also, while if the truth does it or it already exists in our soul, we're going to be impervious to error as well, which is fantastic. It means that we can't be manipulated in any way away from the truth in that point. But you said it is possible to release to uh, release a truth and absorb an error. Of course, it is. Yes. So, what might be an example of that? Well, an example of that often happens during a child, our childhood, for example. So, for example, uh, we might have had with one experience with our, in our childhood that most people have had is is where they're two or three years of age, and for the very first time in their life, they get belted by their parent for doing something. Now. In that moment, there is a deep confusion within the soul of the child. Up until that point in time, the child has only received what you'd call loving responses from its parent. And the child has never had an experience of violence from its parent at that point, not that physical of violence that has created physical pain to their body. And then all of a sudden, the parent has reverted to some kind of physical action that is violent towards the child, that's an assault on the child. Now, the child goes through a deep deal of confusion in that place, right? Because it's never experienced that before. It's, never, it's only ever experienced what, it would, what we would say would be more loving feelings from the parent, right? Now, what happens generally, if that happens once, the child usually goes through a whole set of confusions. If it happens again, and then again, on, a, on a, any subject, the child begins to accept the error Right? and give up the concept that something is wrong. Right? Initially it knows something is wrong because of the pain it's experienced. Right? But after a while it gives up the concept that something is wrong and after a while it even starts to justify, and, I, and, and, and once we become adults ourselves, we often justify the physical punishing violence that has been perpetrated by parents towards us in our childhood. We justify it, saying, oh, I was a bad child or, or whatever. 
So we've actually come to the point of completely accepting the error by that stage. So it can be a progressive thing. Definitely, yes. A smidgen of truth gets lost, a smidgen of error gets Im imbibed as a result. As a bit more truth gets lost, another error imbibed as a result, and so forth and so forth, until such a point in time that the error is like a mountain and the truth is like a molehill, and therefore the truth doesn't govern our actions anymore, the, error do, the errors govern all of our actions. Now, of course, the same process can happen in reverse. The error can be released a bit, bit at a time and a bit of truth will be absorbed about that particular thing. So, for example, if I was talking about this truth about my parents assaulting me during my childhood, by using what we net, what we call, you know, punishing the child through, or, or what we call disciplining the child through, you know, a violent act. Now, I would argue that there's no such thing as disciplining a child through a violent act, in the sense of from 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 a loving perspective. But we won't arrive at that condition initially, just instantly, because we have all these concepts inside of our soul that it is a it is a loving act to for the parent to sometimes restrict the child's actions through violence, right? We believe it because it happened to us <laughs> and it happened to us through a lot of our childhood. So we come to accept that. Now, in terms of releasing that, I would go through, oh, that really hurt that my mum and dad did that. And as an adult, we might process some of that hurt, you know, that we got hit uh, quite frequently sometimes for things. That, and initially, it usually starts by getting, by feeling about the things we got hit about that we didn't deserve. Does that make sense? That we, we knew we didn't do something wrong and they still violently attacked us in some way. After a while, we, so we released that emotion. So now we've released this emotion that, we'd, that we didn't deserve being attacked for things that we didn't do. That <laughs> We released that at least. And now we can accept the truth that nobody deserves to be attacked for things that they didn't do. Right? That we need to make sure of our facts before we go attacking anybody. This may be the subsequent result of that truth entering us. But we still may believe that our parents were loving even though they attacked us at other times when we felt we deserved it. But then we go through another emotion where we realise that we only feel we deserved it because our parents felt we deserved it. So really we, we, we felt we deserved it because they felt we deserved it and it was really some kind of, it was like an emotional blackmail or you could call it almost an emotional programming that caused us to accept that we deserved it. Does that make sense? Then we process through that emotionally. So we release that emotion of, ah, oh, you know, I've just accepted my parents' definition of the world all the time. I've accepted their definition of what's right and what's wrong. And I process through that emotionally. And then I realise I don't have to accept what my parents' view is right and wrong all the time. And then I start to realise that a lot of the things my parents said were right is actually, are actually wrong from a, from a perspective of love, right? And so now I've grown a little more in accepting more truth. And then I go through another process after that generally where, where uh, I start realising, wow, I got punished for all of those things they said were right and I didn't deserve to be punished. So now I process that emotionally. I release all of that emotion about how forgiving them. You know, I go through the process of forgiveness of them in that process of releasing that emotion. And now I come to terms with the fact that I didn't deserve to be hit ever. Now, once I get to that point, I'll realise that actually when my parents hit me, they were committing a violent assault. Right? And once I hit that point, I'll have a big ball or cry about, probably, if I want to release the error of that, that they have actually assaulted me. My parents have assaulted me. In fact, they assaulted me many times during my childhood. And if they had done that to an adult, they'd be in jail probably, still in jail for how many times they have sold me as a child. If they had done that to another adult, they would have got put in jail many times as a result for that particular offence. Then I feel about all that and release all that emotionally and forgive them for that. Does that make sense? And go through that emotionally. Once I come out of all of that, I am very firm now with the truth. And the truth is nobody, no matter their, whatever their age, deserves to be assaulted. And that now is a truth that is firmly in my soul. Nobody can shift it. And it doesn't matter how many people attack me and how many people justify their actions through God or through the Bible or through, you know, some other book or, you know, or justify, I will be immovable. Because all of the error on the subject now has been released 
and I now know the truth that any form of assault on my person is an unloving act. And that's how it usually happens, is this gradual flow. And so when I say any truth on a particular subject, I'm talking about that inter that process, in the process I've just described, for example, which is really a subset of the actual process, and you can see that there was a little bit of truth that I had to come to terms with, and then the error could be, the error could be released and I could come to terms with that truth. And, then it, and initially I receive it intellectually, I think about it, think about it, think about it, to the point where I get to releasing the emotion. Once I release the emotion, now the truth can enter me as a solid fact. And that's how, that's how change occurs. That's the principle of absorption. Right. Mm. Would, um, can I use another example? Sure. Like in growing faith um, as you grow towards God yep. um, and you experiment with the laws mm -hmm. and you have an experience where the law of attraction feeds you back something and you're like, oh, I've had that experience. Yep. So I believe the law of attraction a little bit, mm -hmm. but not like totally. In not my... on every subject. <laughs> no, so just a little bit. And then you have another um, experience and then like, I believe it a little bit more. Yes. So that's the same process. And so you in just... a positive direction. Yes. yes. So you just have more and more experiences having released an error associated with it. Exactly. So, you know, initially we might have this feeling that the law of attraction is just a terror, you know, there's no such thing. No such thing as the law of attraction. You know, what happens to me just happens. And then, then something might happen which seemed to be very correlated with, you know, something that, that you thought about. And, th and then you start going, oh, maybe I, should, maybe I should experiment with this. So that in itself is a shift of truth, does that make sense? But uh, yet to be determined emotionally because it's not entered emotionally. But to get to that point, I've probably usually had to release the anger and rage that I have that there is such a thing as a law of attraction. Does that make sense? So I've released a bit of anger and rage about this concept of law of attraction. And usually how I do that is by, I hear somebody talk about the law of attraction and I said, oh, that's a load of rubbish, you know, and all this anger comes up in me and everything. And that's where me releasing the blockage towards the concept. Does that make sense? And then something might happen in my life that causes me to think, wow, what they said might be true. I might experiment with that. Because I've now released a lot of the anger about it, I'm now willing to conceive that it's possibly true, right? And then once I've, so, so now the anger has been released, there's a little bit of a shift on the law of attraction. And then what happens is an event happens in my life that seems to be a very big event and, and, I, and seems to be related to something definitely that I do feel. And I go, oh, that's interesting. Or even before then, I could have some truth presented to me about the law of attraction. Initially, it might be something like, you know, um, the, the new age version of the law of attraction, which is this concept that you can think your way out of anything pretty much. And then I try to think my way out of it, think my way out of it, think that it doesn't work at all and I get all angry and racial about that and upset with the whole concept and give it all up. And there's some more emotion released. And then somebody presents the concept of the law of attraction to me that it's actually to do with your emotions that guide your law of attraction, what's going on in terms of what you attract. And, I, and then I can, well, yeah, I've now given up all the blockages to the belief, the denial of the belief, the concept that it's an, a, an intellectual process has been given up now. Now I'm open to the concept that it might be an emotional process. And now I can experiment with that. And in the process of experimenting with that, I'll learn some things that cause me to give up more emotions that eventually help me come to see that the law is a loving law and based around, and then after a while I have so much faith in it that anything that happens to me, I always firstly examine myself so because I know for certain that it's got to be something in my soul that created it. Eventually I get to that point. Yeah. But again, it's a gradual process. I release a little bit of error, a little bit of truth comes in. I release another little bit of error, another little truth on the same subject that I've just released comes in and so forth until I get to the point where it's built into a mountain of truth that has been absorbed by my soul and I'm now solid in the concept. And in that process of the incremental process, um, is that when can confusion can happen? Well, yes, because at that point in time, you've got bits and pieces of the truth on, on di different subjects all, all there, in, in there, um, because you've had to release the error about that bit. And so the truth about that bit can enter you. But the truth about all bits hasn't 
been released. Uh, the error about all bits hasn't been released, so the truth about all bits cannot be absorbed. And so during that phase, we often go through, you know, what you classify as doubt or, or, or um, sometimes what you'd classify as regression, you know. So if we got some kind of evidence to the contrary that we didn't understand, that we attribute with our mind to being a flawed concept, we may absorb that error as well and we might go through little cycles in amongst all of that. So, and that does frequently happen for people where uh, they're not comfortable with the concept of doubt. They're not, and, and as you know, doubt creates a lot of discomfort internally, emotionally, emotional discomfort. And most people are not willing to release emotional discomfort. In other words, they're not willing to feel emotional discomfort, not understanding that the emotional discomfort itself is an error. Because why are we so uncomfortable not knowing? That's because when we were children, generally, and we didn't know something, we were often humiliated, laughed at, sometimes ridiculed, and sometimes even punished for not knowing when it was a sincere case that we just didn't know. And so when we don't know as an adult, we actually have quite a lot of fear associated with not knowing. And as a result, that's one of the errors that needs to be released, our fear about not knowing. From God's perspective, there is no fear in not knowing. If we lived in a universe where we were never punished for not knowing something, then, or never laughed at for not knowing something, and never humiliated for not knowing something, then I doubt whether we'd have any blockages to not knowing something. I doubt whether we'd worry about what we do and don't know. We'd be like two-year-olds. We'd be like two-year-olds who have never been punished, who have never been controlled, never been laughed at, who just go, maybe daddy this, maybe daddy that. You know, what's going on here? What's going on there? Why, 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 why? My, my, my son was when he was two. Why everything? And, and that's what we'd be like in the universe we lived in. We, we, we wouldn't have any worry about that place. We wouldn't, we wouldn't feel like anybody's looking down on us in that place. Uh, even if, if we were an adult, we wouldn't be ever concerned about that place. But again, we can only get to that place by releasing the error. And the error has been imbibed through usually our childhood experience, absorbed into our soul. And now we have this feeling in our soul that says, if I don't know something, someone's going to make fun of me. If I don't know something, someone's going to make me feel humiliated. If I don't know something, somebody's going to punish me. And if I've been violently abused as a child when I didn't know, if I don't know something, somebody's going to torture me. You know, that, that in the end might be the strength of that emotion, which is very overpowering, right? And unless that error is released, that emotion inside of me that's determining that reasoning is released, I will find it very difficult to go through doubt. I'll, I'll be in a panic every time I'm in a doubt. As a result, yeah. Okay, there's another example. Sure. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to go along with that. So, yeah. um, still on absorption, obviously. Yeah. Um, violence, the truth is that violence towards anyone is not loving. Yeah. And the error is that that person made me angry, so violence towards them is fine. Yeah. That's justified. Yeah, so we brought up this example in the first principle too, but, but remember the first principle was, a, uh, the first principle which was preclusion, which was about the state of the soul. So while I have inside of me a feeling, preclusion says, a feeling of the opposite type cannot exist inside of me at the same time. So, so that's, that's the case with preclusion. Here we're talking about, let's say I want to absorb into my soul the idea that no form of violence is, is acceptable, that all forms of violence are unloving. Let's say I'd like to absorb that concept into my soul. But inside of my soul at the present point is, is, and I admit to myself that it is, present in the, uh, right at this moment, this idea or concept that actually violence under certain conditions is loving. Then you can see from this example that what I would need to do is I would need to look at the conditions under which I define violence as okay, and I would have to release some error about those particular beliefs in order to fully accept that no form of violence is, is a loving act, right? And so that means that for the new concepts to be absorbed in my soul, I'm going to have to go through some kind of process that, that allows me to see the error and to see what, you know, the, what we could call the characteristics or attributes of the error, because it, it might only be under certain circumstances. For example, I might only uh, justify violence if my child's being harmed. Right. So I'm still justifying violence, but only a ver under a very slight or, or 
a very slim definition. Socially acceptable definition. Yeah, and often socially acceptable. And um, mind you, the murderer justifies violence under uh, a lot of very wide definitions, right? Uh, and, and so, uh, but, but m many of us will become a murderer under certain circumstances. You know, for example, uh, if, I become, if, if a person becomes, if a woman becomes pregnant from somebody that she doesn't want to be pregnant from, she might justify an abortion, which is a murder, under certain circumstances. The fact that she doesn't want the child. She's justifying the abortion. She's justifying the murder. So for most people on the planet, there is some kind of level of justification of violence uh, under certain circumstances. What we need to do is be willing to find out what the error is, why we justify the violence under those circumstances, and then we need to feel the error. We need to do something with this error pr to process it, to release it from our soul so that it no longer is in our soul. Once it's no longer in our soul, the pro this concept of absorption says the truth will be able to enter us really easily and we'll be able to completely live by it after that point with, that, with, with no impediments whatsoever. So I'm not sure whether this is this point, but yeah. is that an automatic process or do you have to long to, to God for that to happen? Yeah, the truth entering us is not an automatic process, just like the error leaving us is not an automatic right. process. Once the error's yeah. left, is it automatic? Well, it depends, you see. If we're, if we're now choosing to do this progress, the change of the soul with God, then what we could be doing is we could be longing for God's love. And when this error releases us from our soul, the love will enter and the love will bring with it the truth that we're seeking. Does that make sense? But, it, but if it's a process we're doing without God, then we're not receiving God's love, but we still have the capacity to absorb the truth. But it has to be something that we choose to do with our will still. So, so it depends on what path we're on, whether we're on the way, the, you know, the divine love path, as people refer to it, or the way to God, or whether we're on the natural love path, or, 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 which is not the way to God, but the way to the becoming the perfect natural man. No matter what form of development we choose, there will be this process of having to release an error and to imbibe or absorb the truth. And how rapidly this occurs will depend on whether we got God's help to do it or not through receiving divine love or not. If we receive divine love, it can be a very rapid process. If we don't receive divine love, because, of, because divine love softens our souls, it can be a very rapid process. If we don't receive divine love, uh, because there's not that softening of our soul, then we have to choose to soften our soul, which is often a very difficult process to engage, which takes a lot longer time but it's still possible. We can become the perfect natural man while we're on earth. When I say perfect, I mean perfected in love while we're on earth in terms of our relationship to our fellow man and women um, without God. We don't need to have God in that process. It's much easier if you have God in the process, but you don't need to have God in the process. But also if you have God in the process, if you absorb the truth immediately after you release the error, it kind mm -hmm. of it kind of solidifies the release of the error and makes you more res resilient to more error coming in later. Exactly. So, so, for example, if we release the errors associated on the natural love path, we release the errors associated with this concept about violence, but we don't yet imbibe the truth, then there is the potential of further error entering our soul, isn't there? But if we've released the error and soon after releasing the error, the truth has entered us, then there's no more potential of the error being absorbed by the soul after that point. So, so there is a lot of advantages in doing it God's way, you know, with God's help than doing it by ourselves. But the reality is we can choose to do it by ourselves and still change to, the, to a point of, of the perfect natural man. Okay. So that's all the questions on that subject? Yeah. Yep. So probably if we summarise that subject, what we're talking about here with absorption is this principle that we cannot absorb something new unless the old leaves us. The old has to leave us in some kind of process, which we'll define in another section. It has to leave us first before the new will be absorbed. If we believe we've absorbed the new while we're still conscious the old is within us, then the new has only been absorbed into our mind and it has yet to touch our heart. And that's a very important point because a lot of people think that they have become a different person, but when you put them under pressure, they revert back to their old behaviour. And the reason why is because their soul has yet to change. 
They've only thought they've changed. They haven't actually changed yet. And what I suggest to people who are listening to this is that to truly grow in our soul, we must understand how the soul operates and we must understand this principle of absorption. We cannot grow in our soul unless there is some release that occurs that is stopping the growth of our soul. It's impossible for our soul to grow unless some release occurs, particularly if we have error with regard to that particular thing in our soul. It's also impossible for our soul to degrade in its condition once truth is absorbed by the soul. Uh, we won't degrade in our condition once truth is absorbed. It's impossible for us to do that too. So, so this is what we need to understand with regard to the soul and, and how the soul works with regard to absorption. Um, when you say it's impossible to degrade once you've had truth, um, you said earlier for a child though, they can have repeated experiences where they start releasing a truth. Well, the, the, the difference for a child, but well, when, when it, it's not really different for a child. The, remember the child when it first incarnates into the parents, it has no uh, truth or error in it. Uh, it's like a, a fresh sponge of every truth or error. And so it's very dependent on whether the parents have truth or error in them as to what the child will from that moment absorb. And it will be a process of slow absorption, obviously, over time. It's not going to happen instantly. Um, it will happen over a period of time through experience. And so, so the principles are still the same. But, but for a child, because there is no error and no truth to prevent anything, anything flows into the child, pretty much, unless the child at some point in the future has some point of view of error or truth in it. Now, of course, this is negating... And these principles, of course, are negating the other influences that are upon a child or upon all of us. We must remember that when we talk about the environment, we're not only talking about the parents who are with the child, but the child is capable of absorbing things from other people who are with it, including spirits who are with the child. Now, most children are given a guide, or all children are given a guide and a guardian from the moment of their conception. So that means that the guide and guardian also have the ability to transmit truth or even error to the child and the child accept those truths or errors. And this is how a child often does receive truths without them being in their parents because they have another person who's influencing them with the truth, which is their guide or spirit, their spirit guide or guardian giving them truths, which they then have absorbed because they've been open to absorbing those particular truths. So it's not just a simple matter of what happens with the parents with a child. It, we must remember that the entire environment is affecting the child. And that, in, that includes the environment of the people who are present on the earth and also the environment of the people in, around the child who are in the spirit world. And they will determine how much truth and error affects the child. And for this reason, many children know more truth than their own parents do because they're receiving the truth from guides or guardians who know the truth and they've been open to the reception of those particular truths because they had no error in them to begin with on those particular subjects. Mm. Okay. So we can basically, once we understand these principles, we can explain every single operation in our soul. That's the advantage of understanding the underlying principles. When we ignore these principles, we start believing that we've accepted things with our mind when it's impossible for our soul to absorb those things while error exists within the soul. And so if we understand this principle of absorption, then we will see that uh, it's, it's, it's really a waste of time to try to accept a new truth with our mind without also engaging the process of releasing the error that might prevent the absorption of truth into our soul. And we also can start engaging our mind to find the error that prevents the absorption. Instead of believing with our mind that everything's fine, what we need to do instead is go, no, I can feel in me that I have a different feeling than what I'm trying to accept in my mind and use my mind actively to find what that error is rather than using our mind to deny the error and say, I've accepted the truth when why I haven't really accepted the truth at all. And, and the, the, what's happening around me is proof that I've yet to accept it. 
So when I understand absorption, I will be far more conscious of using my mind actively to find the errors and release them than I will be trying to absorb truths in my mind only without releasing error. So we change the way in which we're using our mind into be uh, a way that supports the development of our soul rather than really opposing the development of our soul. Yeah. Cool. So that's the principle of absorption, absorption, if we can call it that. Clarify. What do you reckon, Andrew? We've got this unresolved now. We've got something we, we would like to clarify. <laughs> What's that? All of us. All the, of us. <laughs> with the truth leaving. It's impossible for a truth to leave an adult once, once it's in. Like, for example, if an adult had a horrific uh, experience, something happened to them. And no, if the, if, if the truth is actually felt in the soul by the adult, it's impossible for them to leave it okay. under any circumstance. So it's only in children that it's possible for it to change. Yeah, and if, for, for an adult, they can act as though they don't remember the truth. Right? But the truth is still within their soul. So, so it's sort of like... Um, should we, should we this is this going to be under dominance or...? Well, yeah, it depends. See, it depends upon what, what is dominant within them still, obviously. Because if a person honours their soul at all times, then it's impossible for them to act in out of harmony with their soul. But if the person does not honour the soul at all times, then what happens is their mind, their mind may dominate their thinking, and their mind is quite illogical under certain circumstances with certain stimuli. So, so it may cause them to act in a manner that's out of harmony with the truth they've already accepted in their soul. But once the soul becomes dominant, it's impossible. Does that make sense? You, you, can't, you just can't do it, because to do it would hurt too much. So say, um, say there's an adult who has a truth in their soul about mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. about violence, for example. Well, let's say they have one about God. Let's say they believe in God and they, and then know, they know have for certain some, God exists. Well, well, I was going to say with the other example, and then they have some hor horrific experiences in their life yep. that causes them to, to change. They, it's impossible for them to change on that subject. They'll always know that God exists. Once, once they've received divine love and, and received that truth, they'll always know God exists but they won't always believe in God's goodness. Right. Because there might be the openness to the concept that God is a God of wrath. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. And so they might, they might change what appears to be changed their mind, but they haven't really changed their mind. They've never really had a truth or error on the subject exposed until the event. And then, of course, once it's exposed, they act in harmony with the error believing that God is a God of wrath and somehow has punished them. Um, does that make sense in the example I'm giving? Um, but that could only have entered them if they had some other error on that subject that yeah. existed already inside of their that. soul already. So, and, and there's a common one, and that is their parents were violent towards them and punished them and, as a result, and said that it was love. So now... You know, there's the concept in the adult who's now only believed in a God of love, but now they're starting to accept that God might also be violent because there is this predisposition to accepting it already that's within the soul that they haven't worked their way through yet. So it just depends on what they've worked their way through. Should we talk about this in the next point? Yeah, if, it can do. We can like, use it as an example. Yeah, it can do. As well. Yeah. It's, it's, this is the issue with it is but. The majority of people will find, will find it very hard to understand what we're going through because until they themselves have experienced these changes in their soul, all of what I'm saying is really just an intellectual, it's really just an intellectual exercise. Does that make sense? And what I'm trying to do is show them, here what I'm trying to do is show them intellectually that they need to engage a different part of themselves other than their intellect. And that's a very difficult task <laughs> because... You know, in the end, they'll have to. We we have to use words somehow to describe a soul-based process that they're trying to use their intellect to resolve. That they really need to use their soul to resolve. 
Do, do you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, because yeah. I didn't get it before, but now we're talking about it with examples. I can relate back to some experiences that I've had and go, oh, now, now yeah, I know what know you what's mean. what's happening, yeah. But when I first read it, I was like, I don't get it. Yeah. 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 And that's how it is for most people when, like, these are, these are what I would classify as, uh, and perhaps we probably sh should just, all of what we've been saying, you could somehow include, Igor. But these, these are, these are, all of these concepts that we're discussing, we've only discussed two of them at this point. But, but all of these concepts are soul-based concepts of truth that the intellect itself struggles to even understand. And so what we're trying to do is to try to help an intellect that doesn't understand soul-based concepts of truth that can only be understood by the soul itself. And, uh, and, and so that's a very difficult task, of course, to explain truths in that, in that regard. But what I'm trying to do in this discussion with people is try to help them see how they can measure progress that's actually occurred in their soul and the reasons why they revert to old behaviour. And the re reasons why a person reverts to old behaviour has nothing to do with the fact that they've regressed. They haven't regressed. If, if, if something was truly in their soul, they could never regress. So all, when they seemingly regress, it's because they, the truth wasn't in their soul in the first place on that subject and it was only in their mind. That's why they can regress. Does that make sense? So... I think so. Do you I, that was, I, I think, that? well... I started relating it to something about my, my, my own life mm -hmm. and then, and then I... Well, remember, if, if my, uh, something you've related to me in your own life. You mentioned how we, myself and Mary, went away last trip or so away and then you just had these burning desires to drink alcohol <laughs> for some reason, right? <laughs> and I think from what you told me, you got drunk one night or whatever. Uh, I, twice, I, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, obviously you would have felt pretty bad about that at the time. But, but you then view that as a regression, right? But it's not a regression. On this particular subject of alcohol consumption, you have not made a shift yet. And, and you've only exercised your mind to, to make a change. The actual soul-based change has yet to be made. Does that make sense? Because once the soul-based change is made, you won't even feel a desire for it. In fact, you will find it quite repulsive. You'll find the But I did find it more repulsive than I used to. <laughs> of course, but <laughs> so not completely not so. Not completely repulsive at because, all. Because what happened was certain emotions came up inside of you, right? And, and you might feel free to discuss those emotions if you want to. You don't have to. <laughs> I know that sometimes can run. But certain emotions came up in you that overcame your repulsion. Yeah, it was... It was self-punishment that I was going through. Okay, at the time. so yeah. this is emotions regarding how you feel about yourself were so strong and strongly negative and those weren't ever dealt with and still still aren't. not dealt with. No. <laughs> and and as a result of that, there will be times when you revert to behavior that you're not proud of through alcohol consumption because because the particular thing that drives the desire for alcohol is still present within. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it might appear to be a, 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 a regression of some kind, but the reality is there was never progression on that subject in the first place for there to be a, pro a regression. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're only conscious of it now because of your opening to your soul and your opening to other emotions and your other feelings. You're now conscious of the fact that, that you know, it feels bad when you have the alcohol to that degree and, and you're conscious of that fact. But the reason for doing it has yet to be addressed. And once the reason for doing it is addressed, it, the error-based beliefs in the soul are released about yourself, about how you feel about yourself, then you won't feel like doing it because you'll feel like, how could I ever do it? How could I ever harm this beautiful body that I live in? You know, like <laughs> that's how you will feel inside of yourself. Yeah. Um, so sometimes uh, because... And, and this is what I notice quite frequently as well, is sometimes people receive intellectually a truth, they try with all their might to live in it, and then down the track they give it up. Well, my suggestion is if you can give it up, 
then it was never in your soul in the first place. Because if it's in your soul, you just can't ever give it up. It's as simple as that. And, uh, and so, but people, the problem I feel people have is they think that they can absorb things in their mind and then act, choose to act differently. And that means that they've changed. And it means nothing of the sort. All it means is they've accepted it into their mind. And as I've said to you during this discussion and during our introduction on the subject, the mind is completely incapable of controlling the soul. The mind is subordinate to the soul. So anything that enters our mind, while it's, while it's just in our mind, has no real capacity to control our soul. We'll have to try and struggle and try and struggle and try and struggle and try and struggle and occasionally slip up. That's how it will be while the error exists in the soul on the same subject because the truth has yet to enter the soul on that subject. So it, it, can, um, it can be a bit um, tricking to people in that they can change their behaviour and then yes. they look at the whole preclusion idea and go, oh, look, my actions are different, therefore my soul condition is different. Yes, but, but, put, it's not. but put them under stress. But then they need to look at their law of attraction. And look what happens under stress. Yeah. yeah. Under stress, your soul, if it's got a truth in it, it will not change. Under stress, if your mind has a truth in it but the soul doesn't, you will change. You will change for certain. And that's why under stress, the stre in your case, un the stress of feeling bad about yourself was higher in terms of its pain than choosing to drink some alcohol was. And as a result, you just go ahead and engage the, the, the behaviour that's old behaviour, but it's never become... There's no new behaviour yet, really. That, that, that old behaviour is still solidified in the soul and will remain so until the reasons for it have left, have left you and gone. So, for, for example, there's some people who drink only when they feel bad about themselves. There's other people who drink for, for the sake of getting approval from their environment. So, so the only time they would drink is if they went around uh, to you know, Christmas time to their family or something, somebody offered them a drink, they'll have a drink then, right? That tells you that the truth has yet to enter their soul on that particular subject at that, uh, for that particular time. And it's all related to the error relating to getting approval from the environment, getting, you know, feeling like you're a part of the world is, is the underlying emotion. So, so the beauty of all of these things occurring is the, the law of attraction through the soul condition attracts these events showing to us the error in which exists still in the soul. And if we are conscious of it, we can say, ah, oh, okay, this, uh, this truth has only been in my mind for this entire time. So, for, for example, many people at the moment that we know who have been, uh, you know, here listening to us for four or five years, who, who have been now, you know, living or eating vegan, you know, or eating vegetarian or vegan, we know that many of them have not made a soul shift because you put them in a situation where they're going out to dinner or you put them in a situation where they're with mates or friends, bang, you know, they revert to the old behaviour, they have not yet made a soul shift. It's just an intellectual shift and therefore really quite pointless, actually. And this is one of the things that we must understand with intellectual shifts. They are only advantageous so long as they affect the soul shift. And uh, if they do not affect the soul shift, if we live in the, if we live in the false security of an intellectual shift without making a soul shift, it later on is going to affect us quite negatively. We need to make soul shifts if we're truly going to grow towards God. And if we really want to grow our soul, even to become the perfect natural man, soul shifts are going to be required at some point. And uh, without true soul shifts, we are going to keep reverting to old behaviour until the soul has shifted. Yeah. And we need to like, understand that on the divine love path, uh, you know, when the, on the way to the God, God's way to God, we go through soul shifts very, very rapidly, actually, if we allow them to occur, if we're humble. But most people are not on the divine love path, even those who claim themselves to be. They're still on the natural love path, using their intellect heavily in order to change their behaviour. And as a result of that, they are going to find reversion back to old forms of behaviour fairly consistently until such a time as the soul has actually shifted on the, on the issue. Mm. Okay. So we need to understand that really yeah. if we're going to progress. 
And if we're going to progress towards God, you know, we can choose continually if we want to do to absorb things with our mind without soul shifts. But but God's relationship is with our soul. It's not with our brain or our mind. It's a soul to soul relationship between our soul and God's. So unless there are true soul shifts inside of our soul, our relationship with God will also never change. And that, that's a very important thing to understand. So I, I feel that changing your mind does not affect your relationship with God. And that's another way to see whether you're changing is to see how your relationship with God is changing. Exactly. If your relationship with God is much the same as it was 10 years ago and you don't feel any closer and you've not received divine love since in that time or any of those things, then that should tell you that actually the soul has not shifted. You might have thought it's shifted in your mind, but the soul itself has not shifted and has yet to shift. Otherwise, you would have the growing, continually growing relationship with God happening at the soul level that you would feel and it would overcome everything. It would overcome all of the negative influences around you eventually if you kept growing in that way. So for a lot of people, they have not experienced the soul shift even though they believe they have. And, and that's a sad thing because it, when you live in a false sense of security in that place, it's, it's sort of like, you, you, you're, not, you're not being honest with yourself, but, but also you're not recognising that God wants a closer relationship with you than that. God, God wants to have a relationship with your real self, not the fabricated self that you in your mind have created so that you can avoid your real self. Mm. So this is where like the mind, like I said, has lots of limitations and also unfortunately misleads us many times. And... Uh, and, and if, the, if the mind is developed without developing qualities of the soul, logic is not possible. Mm. Mm. Okay. That was an add-on bit to That was an add-on bit. Yeah. What should we call that? Uh, I suppose it's a bit of background information, isn't it, about, about absorption, but also about how the mind works in... Uh, and preclusion. And preclusion. And, in fact, some of the other principles, what we'll probably do as we discuss some of these more principles is we'll probably have more little discussions like that that come up that illustrate particular points as an amalgamation of the, of the understandings that we're raising. Yeah.